Hi, and welcome to the show. Rate and review at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash podcast. Today in the show, we have Frank Fernari. He is a scientist and healthcare entrepreneur. His Kevin MD article is titled, The Focus of the Internet of Things Must Pivot to Achieve Healthcare Potential. Frank, welcome to the show. Thanks, Kevin. We'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Sure. So, you know, my background has been in science and medicine. I spent probably more years in school than I needed to. So my training is in neurophys, spent some time in medical school. I've got my doctoral work is in molecular genetics and pharmacology with advanced training in structural biology and organic chemistry. So I set myself up to be the person who tries to unravel the mechanism of action of pharmaceutical agents and find targets, you know, across pathological processes and design drugs to do that. So the first company that we had was a pharmaceutical venture. And then we moved on to a, a national medical laboratory that helped clinicians understand you know, how to prescribe drugs better by, by bringing testing that we do during clinical trials to the masses, giving physicians access to the same tools as we would have in a clinical drug trial. And then this company that the, the technology goes back to probably a date myself, 1984, who's kind of started working on this. It's mathematical biology, you know, developing motion analytics systems that help, you know, understand how people move, how to assess treatment, diagnose injuries, that sort of thing, using functional motion as a, as an endpoint or a biomarker, like much like any other laboratory test. So that's in a nutshell, that's my background. I talked to a lot of physicians who are interested in going to the entrepreneur space. They have a kernel of an idea or they have the entrepreneur's spirit. So you've been in this space for a while now. What are some of the challenges to breaking into the healthcare entrepreneur space? It's as bad as it sounds, you know, the idea and the product you develop in the business world tends to be the least important thing once you get out there. And I've got lots of acquaintances, physicians, scientists who have lots of great ideas. And most of the time they may work in a laboratory or on a small scale, but to make them practically useful you know, in the healthcare space, they're not designed to do that. So when I develop something, I always start first with like, why, why would somebody need it? The how, when, where, and when are operators, they're not easy, but they're easier than why. So if you can't figure out why something is to be made, then you should just stop there, you know? And then the second thing, in healthcare is overloaded. People are overworked in this industry. We don't have enough people to deliver it. Access is very limited. So, you know, this has to be easy for the patient and the practitioner. It also has to be economical for the payer as well. So the product really needs to be, you know, the big one is accessible. We've got a major problem that we're trying to fix in healthcare. A lot of people just don't have access to it. And, you know, technological products, no matter what they are, should be designed so everybody can get them, not just people in the middle of a big urban area or people that can afford to get them. And so, you know, we've kind of veered off, you know, in some bad directions in healthcare over the past 20, 30 years. And hopefully, you know, the crisis that we're in um, is going to help to remedy that. So if you want to, if you want to develop something and commercialize it, first, you have to understand that 90% of it is going to be business process understanding how to build a distribution channel, understanding how to get something reimbursed, understanding how to make it part of everyday flow in a hospital or a clinician's office, you know, understanding your end, your end user, your customer. And for most inventors, they just don't, they don't either have that training or they kind of see it as something that is not interesting to them. Like it's somebody else will do that. So a lot of things just die on the vine because the inventor doesn't have the wherewithal to actually push it or brute force it out into the system. How does one go about finding that business information? Because like you said, it takes more than an idea. Do they need to go out and get an MBA? Is it mentorship? How does one go about getting that training? Well, Kevin, you know, I've only, I have only taken one business class in my life. I took accounting, mm -hmm. which is incredibly valuable, by the way, probably the best course in business you could take. I never had the time to get an MBA, you know, and I'm not saying an MBA wouldn't have been a good thing. Had I had the time, I probably would have maybe learned some things that I've made mistakes on, but I will tell you, when you go into business, you have to not be afraid to make mistakes. I've made every mistake you can possibly make in business, but I've only tried to make them once. Yeah. That's the key. So, you know, you do something, it doesn't work. Don't try it again. It's not going to get better just because it's a different month, you know, move on to some other way to solve the problem. So even if you don't have hardcore business education or experience, it's really common sense. It's understanding you know, how to develop relationships with your people in your company, 
you know, how to help them, you know, optimize what they do, work together and helping get your product out in a way that the customer understands why they need it, how it helps them, you know, how it moves their needle and, and then servicing that customer. And those are things that we should all do in any relationship we have, regardless if it's a business relationship or any other one. So a lot of it is just common sense, not thinking you're the center of the universe. You know, you're there to help everybody else. That's your job, not to be recognized or help yourself. All right. You wrote this Kevin MD article earlier in the fall, the focus of the internet of things must pivot to achieve healthcare potential. How does the article come together? Well, you know, a number of years ago, the, somehow the world got together and decided if we just took every piece of data that we can generate and put it in a barrel, somehow we could dig out the answer to that. Right. And, and that's sort of what's called in chemistry is a combinatorial approach. You know, you put things in a barrel, you test something, you pull something out, it, the, the, it still makes a result, you pull it out until you're left with the one thing that actually is causing that. So the issue with that is, is in order to get a quality answer, you've got to understand the nature of the data that go into the barrel. Like you, you just can't throw everything in there and somehow the answer is going to pop out magically because the possible interactions with things are enormous. And we as humans, even with computers, you know, can't possibly determine all the relationships between, you know, I'll give you, for instance, like you and I, there's two of us here. Okay. Yeah. So that's the possible interactions with us are two factorial. It's two times one. Mm -hmm. So we can have two interactions. Bring another person in, it's three times two times one. Now it's six. If you put a thousand things, it, it's a thousand times 999 times 998. You get the picture. That number goes from here to the moon. So, you know, it's really an, a, an impossible task to dig out, you know, a lot of meaningful things from those, that many interactions. So, you know, IOT is a great concept, you know, but it needs to be fine tuned. You know, if we're going to, if we're going to move healthcare forward, we need to drag, drag it, kicking and screaming into the data, you know, realm. So healthcare, when I was a kid, you know, we had like a local hospital and that local hospital is where we axed our healthcare. So that hospital had to have an x-ray machine, it had to have a whole bunch of different clinical specialties in there. And the local hospital was burdened by the carrying costs of all that. And they didn't have enough patients to drive the profitability. So back in the day, when I was a kid, and I'm 64, so when I was a kid, 64 was ancient. Like most people didn't make it to 64. So Medicare didn't have a problem because most of the people that went past 65 would die. Now in today's world, people are living 70, 80, 90, 100. So they're living 35, 40 years past the retirement age and they're accessing healthcare because they're the sickest part of the population. So these hospitals are strapped. You know, they, they don't have the resources. And as you know, we're losing physicians, people and our healthcare folks. They're just not going to healthcare like they used to. You know, it's expensive to become a healthcare professional. You come out, you have a lot of debt. And the only way you can manage to pay it off is if you go to work like in an urban setting where you can make a lot of money. So. You know, the majority of people in America live in rural America and they just don't have access to health care. So the one of the ways to bridge the gap between the chasm between the healthcare delivery device and people accessing it is using technology. And, you know, we now live in an age where with products like we make at Biomech and in other all these innovative products that are coming out. We now have the ability to give people access to data from wherever they are. So. I'll tell people like, what's Kevin, what's the most said word in the last two and a half years on the planet? COVID. 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 Okay. <laughs> COVID. okay. You know what the second most said word was? I don't. Test. Test. Okay. Yeah. So tests are an incredibly important part of the medicine. Greater than 70 or 80% of all medical decisions are made with laboratory results. So, you know, the more we can use laboratory results to drive healthcare, the earlier we'll diagnose you, the more accurate the diagnosis, the, the ability to track your progress through the treatment and make adjustments to that treatment, that's the way the system works. So by, by taking technology out of the laboratory in the hospital and making it available to everybody as we push people away from the hospitals and push them out into their homes or getting treated at local stations, you know, I like the way this is going from a necessity standpoint, healthcare needs to move away from these central buildings we call hospitals. They, they just, they can't manage under the weight of their own expenditures. 
So we've got to diversify that healthcare because I always tell people, you know, health happens everywhere. You know, it happens everywhere all the time. So if I'm sitting out in rural North Dakota, my cancer is every bit as serious as someone who gets it in midtown Manhattan. You know, so that person should be able to get quality data, you know, get treated properly to get diagnosed and those sorts of things. And technology can, can do that. So back to IoT, if we sit down as an industry and take a look at the requirements or the metrics that move the needle, you know, for physicians to use numbers and technology and laboratory tests to diagnose people, we can then start to put together the healthcare IoT and using AI technology, which we do every day at Biomech, we can have good technology that's gonna become predictive and preventative, right? So, you know, that's, I think, where this needs to go. And that's kind of the message I put in, in the article. And it, it's moving that way, you know, it's moving that way, but slowly. So I'm a primary care physician. So give me a case study story, an example of how this more focused IOT can affect my workflow and affect how I care for patients. Sure. So, you know, fundamentally, you know, primary care docs are their first line of defense, right? I mean, you know, you guys are generally the first place someone goes and says, Hey, I've got an ache here, a pain here, blah, blah, blah. It, you guys see these patients often, they become like a family member. So the more you can use technology to assess them and when they come in for their yearly physical, you guys can identify things earlier and then either treat them there or refer them on before they become catastrophic. Because as you know, when they become catastrophic, the outcome's not so good, but the cost of it just skyrockets. So, you know, I'll just give you an example for what we do at Biomec. We have some tools that, that really assess balance and fall risk. You know, literally in, in minutes, we can assess somebody's balance and their fall risk, whether they're in front of you in your office or they're in their living room. So if you as a primary care guy, once you know a year or every time you change a prescription med that may cause dizziness or you, know, you, you get my picture, mm -hmm. you can now have this patient get that data to you and to see if you need to intervene. And so right now you can't do that. You know, if I walk in, you look at me, you can't tell if I'm a fall risk. You may make me walk and observe me or ask me some questions, but patient self-reporting and clinician observation, there's too much pressure uh, on, on that. And it's, it doesn't get you where you need to be. It's like if, you know, I, I did, I worked in oncology in my first life. If you had leukemia, I would never ask you, hey, Kevin, how's your white cell count today? What do you think? Good or bad? You, I mean, you'd, you'd sue me. I would just take a blood sample and test it and count the white blood cells. The same way with, are you a fall risk? I want to measure your balance, mm -hmm. see what number you are. So you can make an accurate diagnosis, a decision on what to do with me. So there's a million ways that technology can really help every piece of the healthcare. But you bring up a, a good point. Primary care is a major place that we need to do better. You know, we don't have a lot of folks going into it anymore because you know the, the they're one of the least reimbursed and lowest paid parts of the clinician system so kids are coming out of school even if they want to go back to the town they grew up in they simply can't afford it you know and don't do it so we're kind of stuck with you know little access to guys like you and so we need to fix that so if we can fix it by getting you data without you having to be there that you can look at in real time then, you know, we start to close that gap and we start to, you know, be able to treat pathology the way we should. So one thing I hear from physicians is the concept of data overload, right? Because a lot of patients now, they have all these devices that can send us whatever yeah. data, they can send us their EKG, blood pressure, mm -hmm. heart rate, and all that. And mm -hmm. you did mention AI to kind of help make sense of that data. So talk more about that. So how can we make sense of all this data that's just really coming to us, because as you know, primary care physicians, we're strapped for time. Sometimes yeah. the last thing we need is just more information. So how can we sift through that, make sense of it? Yeah, and that goes back to the original conversation a few minutes ago. It's the quality of the data and the data that are meaningful that we need to focus on. And again, IoT, the concept was to just grab all the data yeah. and throw it in there and Kevin's gonna sit there at night and try to sort through all of it. Well, you don't have the time to do that. And even if you tried, it, it would be a daunting task. Then you've got to ask yourself, is the data, is this test a quality test? Is it precise, accurate, reproducible? Or is it junk data coming in from some sort of toy out there? There's a lot of toys out in healthcare that aren't medically, medical grade or laboratory grade that people use. And their error rates are huge. 
you know, so you can't really use them. So the way this should really work is we sit down with guys like you and say, all right, Kevin, what do you need to see? What's important to you that, that, that will move the needle for you? So pick, here's 14 things we can measure. How many of these are important? If you say six, then we take those six and we start to put them into an AI algorithm that's going to then be able to take a look at if you've got three of these things, you have a 65% chance of having this. You know, so we can build those models you know, retrospectively because we know the, the outcome now. We would take current patients that have outcomes. We would go back, pull that data out, let the AI engine weight those metrics, and hopefully we would come up with a logical thinking the same way that you think as a physician. So I tell people AI is nothing more than, you know, taking what's in your head and putting it in a computer algorithm. It's the computer isn't getting smart. You know, we're telling it what to look at, what makes sense, what doesn't. So here's something that, that, that I always tell people that they laugh at. AI, there's low intelligence AI or dumb AI like people and smart AI, it's intelligence. So the, the smarter the AI is, you know, driven by more information that you can give us to build into this algorithm, the better we're gonna make it. And again, it's filtering out from the massive amount of stuff out there and picking the highest quality data that's gonna make a difference for you and your patient. So tell us the immediate next step. So if you were in charge of everything, tell us what exactly has to happen next to get from where we are now to where you wanna be. The biggest thing we would do is that we need to restructure how healthcare is reimbursed and paid for. It, it is the most complicated piece of this. It's one of the only commercial systems where you don't buy it directly, you pay someone else who then pays somebody else to do what you want them to do. And it's not a 30 receivable business. The insurance industry, you know, isn't always engaged with what is makes sense medically. You know, they're driven by profit and they're driven by business decisions, not necessarily things that make sense medically. And I don't mean that, that they're purposely trying to harm people. It's just the nature of insurance. This is how the insurance world works. We have a coding system for, you know, called CPT mm -hmm. that is woefully outdated and moves like a glacier. So it prevents technology and innovation from coming in and getting implemented. You know, so there are pieces of this system that the average person has never heard about. You know, and if they knew that most of us who work in the system are paid, you know, 50 cents on the dollar, we get denied a ton for what we do. And then you have, on top of that, you've got a massive amount of people who have no health care, and we have to treat them regardless. Yeah. So we do all this work for free, you know, basically. And we're strapped because we have so many resources. As clinical people, hospitals are strapped because they've got to, you know, expend a, t a ton of money and energy to treat a lot of folks who just don't have health care. And, you know, the it all starts with, you know, everybody should, we should find a way to deliver health care in an affordable manner. Right now, no one's been able to do that. We the, That's where we need to start. The healthcare system itself is full of wonderfully talented people, dedicated people who treat sickness and take care of everybody from cradle to grave every single day. They work tirelessly out there. It's still too burdened by paper. It's incredibly inefficient. You know, I mean, it's, and you guys are tired. You know, the average doc is working, you know, 13, 14, 15 hours a day, you know, six, seven days a week. They're tired. I will tell you, healthcare is burnt out. And a lot of my friends who I went to school with, they're, they've all, they're all leaving. They just can't do it anymore. So, you know, it, it's, it needs to change. And, and I think it needs to start with, you know, re-looking at how the business model is. And you can start to see the evolution of, you know, pay for performance, a cash for healthcare. You know, like, I'm just going to pay you here. Kevin, I need yeah. this drug. I'll give you 40 bucks for it. And, you know, maybe the answer is somewhere in the middle, but we need to really take a look at this thing. We've got thousands and thousands of payers out there in plans, and it's incredibly complicated. And, I, you know, after 35 years in it, I still don't understand it. You know, so, you know, it's it just the whole thing needs an overhaul. We're talking to Frank Fernari. He is a scientist and healthcare entrepreneur. His Kevin in the article is titled, The Focus of the Internet of Things Must Pivot to Achieve Healthcare Potential. 
Frank, tell us some takeout messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. I would encourage people to get tested often out there from a consumer standpoint, from a patient standpoint. The more you know about what's going on with your body, which is an incredibly complicated piece of machinery, by the way. You know, people really could understand how complex genetics and biochemistry, you know, all this is. Your body is very fragile. So, you know, try not to do things to it that are going to cause pathology because we can't always fix it. You know, we can't. I mean, you have to be part of the process taking care of yourself. You know, the burden of responsibility for health rests with all of us first. You know, and, and I think the more knowledge we have, proper knowledge about how to evaluate risk, how to take things that are proper for us, how to take better care of ourselves is a good way to start to help the healthcare system heal itself. You know, if we have less people coming to it with big problems, it's gonna alleviate a lot of the issues we have. You know, second of all, you know, do not do not be afraid to ask your physician things. Ask these guys, you know, talk to them. You know, they will give you very good advice. They'll tell you how to stay healthy. They'll tell you how to eat properly. They'll tell you things not to do. And when they tell you this, here's the big one, listen to them. <laughs> listen to them. Patient adherence is probably 30% across every disease, which is just terrible. You know, people just think they don't have to listen. You know, physicians are highly trained, they're experts. They see, you know, wellness and death every day. They know what's what works and what doesn't. Take advantage of it because you're paying for it. You know, every time you write that check to Blue Cross, use them, you know, and just be very careful about trying to figure things out yourself. You know, the internet's full of stuff. You know, the wonderful thing about the internet is I can get information out there like in a second. And when I was a kid, we had three TV stations. I didn't know what was going on anywhere in the world. You know, we were, everybody was isolated in their own bin. Now I can find anything out immediately, but the problem with it is I can also get bad information really quickly. And don't trust everything you read out here about health and wellness on the internet. Everybody is throwing something up because they have, a, you know, an angle. They want something from you. So just be very careful, use common sense, but at the end of the day, trust the clinical delivery system, trust your nurses, your clinicians, your ancillary health people. They're educated, they know what they're doing and use them. Frank, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for being on the show. Thanks, Kevin.